In this video, I'm going to create a refrigeration cycle using my P. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, a platform that lets you easily set up a website for internet business and, you know, stuff. The government already takes a pretty big chunk of my pay in taxes, and I'll be damned if I let them take my P2, so I started collecting it. You see, this liquid gold isn't just an ointment you apply to jellyfish stings. About 1-2% of it is a compound called urea. Urea has a lot of uses, one of which is that it can produce ammonia really easily. This can be done either by heating the urea or by reacting it with sodium hydroxide. I'll be using the latter method. Once ammonia is extracted, it can be used as a refrigerant. Anhydrous ammonia can be used in a vapor compression system, aqueous ammonia can be used in a vapor absorption system, and ammonium nitrate can be used in an instant cold pack, since it absorbs heat when it dissolves in water. I wanted to try building a refrigeration system that's heat driven, but a vapor absorption system seemed a little bit complex, so I'm going to start with something simpler and take advantage of ammonium nitrate's endothermic dissolving property. The idea is to have a small, thin-walled can full of ammonium nitrate powder which will have water added to dissolve it. Once it starts dissolving, it's placed in an insulated refrigerator box to start absorbing heat. Once it's absorbed as much heat as it can, it's removed from the box and placed on a heater to boil off the water. Once the water inside the can is boiled off, it's placed in a water bath so that it can cool and then the process is repeated all over again. Basically, this is just an instant cold pack that keeps getting recharged and reused. There's a number of substances other than ammonium nitrate that can produce this effect, and I tested several of them. The closest runner-up is urea, but all the others fall pretty far behind, so I'll be sticking to ammonium nitrate. Now you may be wondering if it's safe to handle ammonium nitrate, let alone heat it over a flame, and the answer is pretty much yes. It takes some special initiation devices and additional compounds to make this a dangerous substance. By itself, it's not very scary. In fact, if you directly heat it with a blowtorch, all that's going to happen is it decomposes into water vapor and nitrous oxide. I'm also working with pretty small quantities here. Alright, so to make ammonium nitrate, we're going to need two things, ammonia and nitric acid. Let's start with ammonia. I collected 2 gallons or about 7.5 liters of pee over a few days and began boiling it down to get a higher concentration of urea. This absolutely must be done outside because of the smell. Even a well-ventilated indoor area like an open garage won't cut it. This is about 200 milliliters that's been boiled down from a starting volume of 2 liters. It turns blackish brown like coffee, but don't drink it. I add the concentrated pee into a flask by way of a filter. The filter is to separate out all the insoluble stuff like this dried foam crap or whatever this stuff is at the bottom. I don't know if this is normal or if I need to see a doctor. Though anyway, after boiling down 7.5 liters of pee, I've concentrated it to about 700 milliliters, a little over a factor of 10, meaning there should be about 10 to 20% urea by weight. I took about half the liquid yield and added sodium hydroxide to it to break down the urea into ammonia gas. Unfortunately, this caused so much foam that it overflowed into my collection flask, so I had to reduce the volume of pee in my flask and try again. I did this for a few hours and processed 700 milliliters of pee and sodium hydroxide solution 100 milliliters at a time. You can tell when most of the ammonia has left the solution because the temperature will go up and start boiling the water, which will cause visible condensation on the flask and the lines connected to it. Let's drop a piece of copper in the ammonia solution and leave it overnight. The next morning, the solution is a deep shade of blue. This is from formation of copper hydroxide that occurs when the copper metal reacts with the ammonium hydroxide in the water. Being conservative and assuming the P was 1% urea, the initial 7.5 liters I processed should have contained 75 grams of urea, which is 1.25 moles. When a mole of urea reacts with 2 moles of sodium hydroxide, it releases a mole of ammonia, or 17 grams, meaning if I had a 100% yield, I'd have produced 21.3 grams of ammonia from 7.5 liters of P. That's a pretty small amount, even with 100% yield, which I'm sure I didn't have, so over several weeks I processed an additional 20 liters of pee to ensure I had a decent enough amount of ammonia to carry out this project. I also found that concentrating pee by boiling is more effort than it's worth, and also disgusting, so instead I simply took raw pee with sodium hydroxide and boiled it as shown here. The odor from this process is actually pretty tolerable, so it can be done in a space with mild ventilation. It doesn't need to be done outside. An interesting thing I found when extracting ammonia this way, though, was that my receiver flask barely had any ammonia dissolved in it, reading a measly 9.9 .9 pH, which is less than 0.01% concentration. 
However, the liquid trap I put in place to prevent backflow had a very concentrated solution of ammonia measuring between 11.8 and 11.9, which equates to about 5% concentration by weight. I think this is because the ammonia in the unconcentrated pea was so dilute that it came out of the solution at the same time the water was boiling off, so most of it ended up dissolving in the relatively small amount of condensed water. Anyway, that's how I made ammonia from pee. You don't need to bother concentrating the pee because it's disgusting, energy intensive, and it makes a foamy mess. Now this gives me a business idea. Since pee is basically free, maybe I could sell the ammonia or urea I made from it to turn a profit. Sales in my neighborhood were pretty low, so I'm gonna need a way to do this online. Luckily, there's Squarespace. Squarespace is a platform that provides easy to use tools for building a website, selling merchandise and digital content, tracking inventory and shipping, and providing analytics for all your online business needs. I mean, come on, it's 2023, who's got time to learn HTML coding? Karen over here didn't know a thing about web development, but she was able to use Squarespace to sell her essential oils and healing crystals, and now she drives a Lamborghini. In fact, I'm going to use it to sell off some of my older creations and provide engineering consulting services to make more of that magic internet money. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and if you want to launch a website, go to squarespace.com slash hyperspacepirate to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. Okay, that covers one half of the equation. Now I need to make nitric acid to turn the ammonia into ammonium nitrate. Industrially, this is done by heating up ammonia gas over a platinum catalyst and turning it into nitrogen dioxide, but I don't have the proper equipment for that, so I'll be using an older method called the birkland eide process. In this process, air is ionized by a high voltage arc. When the O2 and N2 molecules are ripped apart by the high temperatures of the arc, the atoms usually recombine right back into O2 and N2, but sometimes they come out funny and make a nitric oxide molecule. This molecule then quickly reacts with additional oxygen to form nitrogen dioxide, which is a brownish yellow gas. When nitrogen dioxide bubbles through water, it reacts to form nitric acid, which is HNO3. This process is much less efficient than other methods of making nitric acid, but it has the advantage that it requires no reagents. You can literally make the acid out of thin air. For starters, I'll need a high voltage power supply. To do this, I'll just use the tried and true ZVS driver with a flyback transformer. My driver runs off 24 volts and has a transformer with 8 turns on the primary and about 1000 turns on the secondary, so a ratio of about 125. With the resonant voltage across the primary being around 75 volts, that comes out to a peak voltage around 9400 volts. This particular transformer has a grounded center tap rather than being grounded on one side of the secondary coil. This makes it less likely that the secondary coil will arc to the transformer core. Let's try running this thing. I've got some copper electrodes arcing inside a sealed pasta jar. Within about 30 to 40 seconds, a yellowish brown gas appears. That's our nitrogen dioxide. This stuff smells a little bit like chlorine, but sweeter. Oh yeah, did I mention this should be done in a well-ventilated area? Here's how this is gonna go together. As mentioned before, we've got the ZVS driver with the transformer. The electrodes live inside a pasta jar, which has a barb fitting on either side. The lower side barb will attach to an aquarium air pump, and the upper barb will go to the bubbler. The electrodes will get insanely hot, so they're gonna need to be water-cooled. A water pump will circulate distilled water through the electrodes and a larger water reservoir to keep everything cool. The coolant needs to be either distilled water or oil, otherwise it'll conduct between the two high voltage electrodes. The jar itself will get pretty hot too, and we don't want to crack the glass, so a fan will be attached to blow air over it. Another fan will be added to keep the ZVS driver cool. The fans in the water pump run off 12 volts, so they'll be powered from DC to DC buck converters that will step the 24 volt power to the ZVS driver down to 12 volts. I used a buck converter for each device since I didn't know how much current they draw, but in reality I probably only needed one. Here's a look at the system in action. Oh yeah, I also added this copper coil into the water coolant loop since the reservoir was getting too hot. Now it stays below 40C. I used this really tall measuring tube to give the gas bubbles more dwell time in the water, but I think most of it is still escaping rather than reacting. The production rate was extremely slow. Here's a graph showing an example of pH measurements versus runtime. I suspected my cheap meter wasn't super accurate at such low pH levels, so I actually got some 65% nitric acid and used it to make different concentrations of acid and measure them with my meter and compare that to the known pH based on the formula for a strong acid. You can see here the meter reads pretty high and the air gets even worse with lower pH. Using this data, I applied a correction factor to my readings then managed to determine my production rate. Based on this data, my average production rate was about 0.37 grams per hour or 8.88 grams in a 24 hour period. 
My input power was about 200 watts, so this works out to about 1.85 grams of nitric acid per kilowatt hour. In the industrial Birklandite process, the yield is about 60 grams per kilowatt hour, meaning I'm at just over 3% of that. Needless to say, there's some major room for improvement, both in the arc forming and the gas dispersion, but that's a subject that deserves its own video. I ran the acid generator for several weeks while simultaneously generating ammonia until I was confident that I had produced enough of both reagents to make 1 or 200 grams of ammonium nitrate. After the first day of running the generator, I poured out about 400 ml of acid and 500 ml of ammonia solution into a beaker. In theory, I should have an excess of ammonia, so there shouldn't be leftover acid when everything boils down. And here's what was left over. Both solutions started with distilled water and only had gases dissolved into them in the form of either nitrogen dioxide or ammonia, so the only thing that could possibly be here is ammonium nitrate. Okay, about 3.2 grams. That's pretty tiny, but it only took about 12 hours of running the acid generator, so I think that's actually okay. After three days of continuously running the acid generator, I mixed up another batch with some ammonia and boiled it down again. This time there was definitely quite a bit more nitrate, but somehow I ended up with an excess of nitric acid and the whole yield was stained yellow and smelled pretty strongly of nitric acid once the last of the liquid had started to boil off. Oh well, let's bust it up and see how much we got. This time it's 17 grams. Still pretty small, but not terrible. And just to demonstrate that this is in fact ammonium nitrate, I'll dissolve it in some water and you can immediately see the temperature drop. For subsequent batches, I tested the solution with a pH meter before boiling to ensure there wasn't an excess of acid, so they came out white and odorless like this one. Here's a much larger batch I made after about two weeks of collecting ammonia and running my nitric acid generator 24-7. This batch reads 71 grams, two of which is for the plastic bag, so 69 in total. Nice. Just to demonstrate that ammonium nitrate is fairly safe by itself, I took a sample from my yield and hit it with a map gas torch. First it melts into a goo, and then it begins to bubble as it decomposes to nitrous oxide and water vapor. This process actually happens at a pretty low temperature, around about 200 C, so I can even do it on my hot plate. Again, we see the puddle of goo as the nitrate melts at around 170 C, as we heat further, thick white smoke is produced, which is a combination of steam from the water vapor and probably tiny bits of atomized nitrate. After a few minutes, there's almost none of the original material left in the beaker. Okay, so now that we've got ammonium nitrate, and we know it's not going to turn the house into a smoking crater, let's try to make some stuff cold with it. I got this little thin-walled aluminum can that holds 120 ml to act as my cold pack. I'm going to add 50 grams of ammonium nitrate to it and 80 ml of water, which should be about the proportion for a saturated solution. Through this tiny hole in the top, I'll place a thermocouple and measure the temperature. Here's a chart of the temperature drops I recorded with ammonium nitrate and several other saturated salt solutions. Urea, ammonium chloride, and sodium nitrate are all pretty decent substitutes, but ammonium nitrate is still the best one I tested. This even works with regular table salt, but the effect is pretty pathetic. To build the fridge, I printed this water tank for thermal inertia, which a soda can will go in the round portion of. In retrospect, the heat transfer would have been much better if the soda can was just placed directly into the water. The tank will sit on this chunky foam base so that it's well insulated against the surface it's sitting on. Here's what the lower portion of the fridge looks like. It's basically just some foam panels I got from packaging glued together, and I added some foil tape to seal up the gaps. Then I filled the water tank and placed my drink inside, then covered the fridge with a foam lid, which has a hole just big enough for the cold pack can to fit inside of. I shake up the nitrate solution and pop the cold pack into the fridge to let it absorb heat from the water tank. Once the temperature in the water tank flatlines, it's time to take out the cold pack and regenerate it. To do this, I brace together a little copper frame to hold the can over a burner and boil off the water. Once the water is boiled off, the can is removed and placed into a water bath to bring it back to room temperature. So that's great in theory, but the problem was I found the water would splash out of the pinhole when the solution began boiling and extinguish the flame on the burner below, so I had to dump the contents out of the can into a larger diameter beaker and heat them on my hot plate. Even after I solved the splashing problem, the big issue I ran into was that the nitrate wouldn't form back into the nice fluffy powder I started off with when the water was boiled off. It would form one big crystal chunk, which had way less surface area for the water to interact with, making it take forever to dissolve and diminishing the cooling power. At one point I also tried putting razor blades in the can to create more nucleation sites for a smoother boiling and maybe break up the crystalline nitrate, but all this ended up doing was reacting with residual nitric acid and turning my ammonium nitrate brown. I think I should have used broken glass instead. Due to the logistical issues with recharging the cold pack, I went ahead and just used the entire collection of ammonium nitrate I made instead of cycling the same 50 grams back and forth to cool and then regenerate. 
Here's a graph of the temperature versus time, and you can see that by the time I got the first pack regenerated, the temperature had risen back up to nearly ambient, so thereafter I simply added in new powder every time the pack had finished absorbing heat. Of course, all the ammonium nitrate was eventually regenerated, but in order for a cycle like this to work properly, I think it needs to occur in a rotation where five or six packs are regenerating while one is in the fridge. Also, once I got below about 14C, the progress sort of stalled, and the temperature didn't really want to go below 13C despite having gotten it to nearly freezing temperature when I tested the cold pack by itself. After everything was said and done, I did enjoy a moderately cooled coke, but I think the next time I try to create refrigeration with my pee, I'll do it with a vapor absorption cycle using ammonia. Also, the cooling performance of urea was close enough to ammonium nitrate that I think it would have been way easier to just extract the raw urea out of my pee and use that instead of going through the extra steps to turn it into ammonia and to make nitric acid. Finally, let's look at the efficiency of this process. According to a document I found on the internet where everything is true, the heat absorbed by dissolving ammonium nitrate in water is 25.7 kilojoules per mole, meaning the 50 gram charge in my cold pack should absorb about 16.1 kilojoules. Raising water from around 25C to 100C and then causing all of it to vaporize requires 2,564 joules per gram, so it would take 205,098 joules of heat to boil off 80 ml of water and recharge the cold pack. This means in an absolute best case scenario where everything works perfectly, the efficiency of this refrigeration cycle is 7.85%, which is pretty piss poor. I guess next time I'll do a vapor absorption cycle. Thanks for watching my pee fridge.